today I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about some of the more interesting um, cases I've had in researching Clifton Park history. Uh, you know, digging up history is a lot of fun, uh, and uh, sometimes it's a you know you have to it's a lot of work, but it's very rewarding, and you find some interesting facts, some interesting things, and so I'm going to talk about some of the more interesting things that I've discovered in researching Clifton Park's history. <clears throat> so, to get oops, this is very sensitive. So to get started. Just a few words about uh, what a historian uh, does. Uh, New York State is unique in the fact that uh, um, every municipality is required to have a historian. And uh, so there are like uh, 600 historians throughout the state of New York, municipal historians. And a variety of characters, some have full-time jobs, some are retired people who just uh, answer historical inquiries, uh, et cetera, so it runs the full gamut. But as I say, New York is the only state uh, that has this program. And uh, uh, what do we do? Well, we, we're, we try to interpret the local history uh, for both the residents and non-residents of the community, and we, uh, and, and research that history and then interpret it for people. And we do that in a variety of ways. Uh, we publish books. Uh, uh, we do exhibits in various places. Uh, we do tours. That's a bicycle tour, an annual bicycle tour that I've been doing for a while. Um, put up historic markers to let people know what they're passing by on a daily basis has some historical significance and what that is. Uh, uh, I've done a, uh, a monthly article in the, uh, in the newspaper on history. All of this just to make people in, in the area aware of, of the background, the history of their locality. Now, some of the stuff I'm going to be talking about today, you can find in a couple of the books that I did write. One of them is Bits of Clifton Park History. And a lot of the stuff that I've been telling you, if you want to find more information on the subject, it's all written in here. And then if you like early photographs, there's this book here that I did in 1996. It's part of that Images of uh, uh, America series that's done by Arcadia Press. And uh, so you'll find a lot of historical pictures in this book. Both of these are available for purchase at the town hall but they're also here at the library. You can actually charge them out and take them home, take a look at them. Um, another interesting fact is that we have many historical photographs of the town online. Uh, so you can go to them through the library's website. And if you go to local history, uh, and there'll be a, uh, something about a selection of early photographs of Clifton Park. And if you click on that, we have over 500 historical photographs of the town, a few interesting manuscripts up online that again you can read from home on your own computer by accessing the library's website. Okay, so that being said, that's the plug for my books. Okay, um, okay so I'm, I've organized this talk the way I've sort of organized uh, bits of Clifton Park history. Incidentally, I'm working on another uh, uh, book, which should be out in maybe a year or two, uh, more uh, bits of Clifton Park history. Uh, so anyway, beginnings. A couple of the interesting um, uh, discoveries that I, I made in the early part of Clifton Park's history was the fact that I, I worked at the New York State Museum uh, for about 42 years. And uh, as a child prodigy, I started <laughs> pretty young. And uh, uh, one day, a volunteer, um, uh, Bill Simmons, uh, uh, who was uh, cataloging some collections in the archaeology department, came running in and said, hey, we just found a whole uh, boxes of collections that were uh, excavated at Fort's Ferry in Clifton Park 
Forts Ferry was our town's first settlement. Uh, people started moving in there about 1670, and the ferry was begun in 1727 by Nicholas Fort. Uh, and uh, so I had no idea that there had been an excavation down in Forts Ferry until Bill came running in and told me. And they had no idea they had this collection because it had been kicking around the museum since the 1950s. Uh, but no one had connected it with Fort's Ferry. Uh, and I'll tell you why in, in just a second. So these are some of the artifacts that were found down at our, the first settlement here in, uh, at Fort's Ferry. Let me make sure I get which is the pointer. This is the pointer. Okay. So these are, these are um, uh, flip glasses, the basis of, uh, of flip glasses. Flip glass was the type of thing that was glass that was used at taverns to hold beer, uh, ale. And then you have some, uh, th this dates to just after the American Revolution. This is probably around 18, 1800, these uh, um, pieces of dishes. And uh, you know, here's Bill, took a picture of Bill cataloging the collection, working with the collection. Um, and so here's where these things were excavated. Uh, this is the old Fort House um, that was owned by the man who operated the ferry. And it was also used as a tavern or an inn uh, during the 18th century, which explains why they found all of these remains of flip glasses uh, and, and dishes at the site. So Ed Brooks is the man who excavated the site, and he was a professional archaeologist. He had done some digs in, in New England. and. Uh, he sort of retired to this area and decided he wanted to do a dig here at the early settlement of Forts Ferry. Now this is state-owned land, and it's still state-owned land. The town of Clifton Park uh, uh, has a permit to uh, use it as the Bishop Ferry Nature and Historic Preserve. This, is, this site is now in the Bishop Ferry Nature and Historic Preserve. And um, so you had to get a permit to dig there. You just can't go down and, and dig on, on public lands. I talk to a lot of people who have metal detectors. They want to go down there and see what they can find. That's illegal. Uh, the uh, artifacts in the ground belong to the state, and they're safe in the ground. You know, with a, and if you talk to an archaeologist, I mean, that's the whole point of archaeology. It's context, context, context. It's where these artifacts are found. Metal detectors remove them from the context. Um, at any rate, so he did get his permit and uh, did the excavation. And, and these artifacts then have to be uh, uh, given to the education department, the state education department, because they actually own the, the artifacts. And so the collection was given to the, uh, the state museum. That's how it ended up there. Uh, after, um, and then Ed Brooks died uh, a couple of years later. I think he died in, in 1954. And it wasn't until well after 1954 that his daughter uh, donated the actual notes from the excavation, the write-up that he did. And somehow, that write-up never got associated with the artifacts until Bill Simmons put the two, put two and two together. So uh, that was sort of a, an interesting thing. And we did have an exhibit of these uh, artifacts. And if you're interested in archaeology, uh, on May 3rd, it's a Sunday afternoon, uh, we're opening an archaeology exhibit at the Historic Rooms Tavern. Uh, it's going to be called the Archaeology of Clifton Park. We've, uh, there, a number of sites here in Clifton Park have been excavated and we have those artifacts. We're going to exhibit them and we're going to, uh, we have invited the uh, uh, Christina Reith, who's the New York State archaeologist, uh, to come and, and speak on uh, this program where the subdivision goes through through when there's a uh, historic interest in the property they do an archaeological survey before uh, a subdivision is allowed to continue and that's how we got most of these uh, archaeological artifacts that we'll be exhibiting in may <clears throat> so another uh, event that we did associated with the very beginnings of clifton park history was we had a big family reunion for Clifton Park's first family, uh, and that was the Van Branken family. They were the first settlers who came across the river from 
colony uh, and Niskayuna uh, in the 1680s, and they were the first residents of our town. And uh, uh, the first uh, settler had three, uh, three sons, Mouse, Adam, and I can't remember the other one right off hand, Garrett. Um, and they had lots and lots of children, and their children married into many of the other early families in town. And so there are many, many descendants of the Van Franken family today in town. They don't all have the last name Van Franken because they married, the women married into other families, but there's a lot of them around. So we decided to honor the family as our first family, and we had a special exhibit at the library. At that time, the library was uh, located uh, over by the, by the mall there in Clifton Park uh, 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 Mall Road there. Clifton Country Mall Road. Uh, and uh, one of the elder members of the Van Franken family was Bill Van Franken, and he was honored at this event that we had at the library to open the exhibit on the Van Franken family. And uh, the town issued a proclamation uh, calling this Van Franken Day. And uh, here I am uh, reading the proclamation. Now this was, did I give a date when this was held? Yes. 2000, the winter of 2000. So that was a lot of fun, and uh, you know, uh, other people were invited as well, but this was to honor the Van Franken family, and we had lots of descendants come, and we encouraged them to bring their family heirlooms so that we could talk about them and exhibit them on that day. John? Yes? Uh, you mentioned Fort was the first settler in Clifton Park? No, Van Franken was. Van Franken, well, you said something about Fort being the first of something. What was that? Well, he started the ferry, at Fort's <laughs> Ferry, which was named for him okay, in, in 1727. And that's another interesting story because there was a fort on the other side of the river that was there in the late 17th century. There's a map that shows it there in 1698. It was called the Fort at Canastigione. Canastigione is what the Indians call the land. It's an Iroquois word meaning corn flats because they raised corn down there. And the family that took care of the fort <clears throat> was a French Huguenot family. Their last name was Libertant. Uh, but because of their association with the fort, they became known as the Fort family. And that's how they took on their surname of Fort. And they were one of the first families that came across the river along with the Van Brankens. It was Nicholas Fort who started the ferry. <clears throat> Settlers and homesteads. Oh, this is sort of an interesting story. Israel Brooks was an early settler here in Clifton Park. He came here in 1778, and he came from West Springfield, Massachusetts. Now, uh, he, his, his wife, who he married in 1754, was Miriam Morgan. And uh, he had eight children with, him, with her, uh, four girls and four boys. Uh, and the last one was born around 1773. Well, interestingly enough, all of a sudden, that same year, he has other children being born by another woman. And her name was Sarah Bagg. And uh, eventually, he had another five children with Sarah. And in 1778, he and Sarah, along with their three children at that time, came to Clifton Park. They moved from West Springfield to Clifton Park. He left his wife Miriam behind. And, uh, and so they, uh, they lived in the area that's now known as El Nora. At that time it was called Hubs Corners. And uh, he, he died, he got ill. He died about 1794. Uh, Sarah, uh, she died in 1801. But Miriam outlived them all. She didn't die until 1809. And uh, he had sold his land in West Springfield with the stipulation that Miriam, his wife, uh, have a 50-year lease on it. In other words, so she could stay there as long as she lived. And then uh, the land went to this person who he sold it to. So uh, there was never any divorce or any marriage to Sarah. Uh, he just took up with this other woman and came here to Clifton Park. And there are lots of descendants here of, of, uh, of Israel Brooks. And they've married into some of the other early families. And those of which I know who are descendants of Israel Brooks, I always remind them that they're all illegitimate. <laughs> so. <clears throat> 
Um, this is the home of uh, William uh, Shepherd and Margaret McIntosh. You might recognize this. This is the Bowman's Orchard. Yes, and it was the rear section that was built in the 18th century. The front section was built about 1832, but the rear section is the oldest, and that's where William Shepherd and his wife Margaret lived. Now, Margaret was the daughter of Alexander McIntosh. Alexander McIntosh came here from Inverness, Scotland, um, to fight in the French and Indian War, and he was at Fort Ticonderoga. He evidently liked it here because he went home, and he returned here in 1776 with his family. And they lived in what is now the Pine Bush area of Albany for a couple of years before they moved to uh, what's now Clifton Park. And they lived not too far from, from where uh, Bowman's Orchard is now. Uh, Alexander had a family, and one, uh, one of the, his, uh, his wife's name was Jeanette. One of their sons was John McIntosh, and uh, he, was a, he was a troublemaker. He, he, he um, liked this girl down in Visher Ferry. Her name was Dolly Irwin, um, and uh, neither one of the parents particularly cared for that match, but somehow he managed to get uh, uh, Dolly with child. And uh, to get away from him, Dolly Irwin's parents decided to move away. And they went, they went to Canada. They moved up to Ontario, Canada. Well, uh, poor John, he was so forlorn with his love leaving, uh, he ran away. He decided to follow her up to Canada. And uh, he did. He found them, but he found out that poor Dolly died on the way up to Canada. She, probably uh, was not feeling well, carrying the baby, etc. At any rate, so he uh, decided to stay in Ontario anyway. He married somebody else, and there was this wonderful apple tree that was growing outside his farmhouse there in Ontario, and the apples on it were really good, so he decided to propagate it. it became the Macintosh apple. And it's interesting because that's what they grow now, at Bowman's Orchard, where the Macintosh family used to live. And Alexander and his wife are buried in that cemetery. It's right by the dump. I guess it's called a transfer station now. Yeah. <clears throat> OK, transportation is another theme that continually runs throughout our town's history. <clears throat> this is lot 19. Uh, down in Vichy Ferry. It's now within the Vichy Ferry Nature and Historic Preserve. And this is the way it looked uh, about 1885. Uh, and that's the uh, little canal store that was down there at the lock. Uh, they had these stores at many of the locks so that people could replenish their, excuse me, their supplies. Uh, the canal boats were not very big, so they couldn't store very much on them. At any rate, that young man in the center there, right in the doorway, his name is John Wooden. And he was one of the last lock tenders at Lock 19. And he also ran the Fisher Ferry. Well, uh, back in the 1970s, we had a very active civic association uh, in Fisher Ferry. I see Joe here. She was very active in that. And we did a lot. And we, have, we had an annual canal day. Uh, before Waterford even dreamed of having one. Uh, and uh, in 1975, one of the things we did for our, oh, it was a lot of fun, we had antique cars, we had uh, reenactors march down the street, etc. Uh, and one of the things we did was interview people. We invited people who had stories about uh, early Clifton Park or early Fisher Ferry to come and tell their story. One of these people was John Wooden uh, in 1975. So we interviewed him about his life as a lock tender um, down at Lock 19 and also operating the ferry. And uh, we have this tape now. It's right here at the library, and you can, you can access it. I'm not sure whether you can access it from the website or not. Not yet, but we do. It's here, and there's a lot of information in it. In fact, I think there's excerpts from it. We have a, there's a, um, a site on the library's website where you can go to uh, pictures, early pictures of the canal, and we've snipped in some 
interviews of people who remembered the canal. So something else you can do from your home computer. Uh, at any rate, here's the ferry that uh, John Wooden ran. Uh, and this would have been in the early 1900s that he did this. So, uh, and he was also on the baseball team, the Amity baseball team, uh, Fisher Ferry. Uh, but what was, what's interesting was that uh, um, in 19, I think it was 1995, it was in 1995, this gentleman from Niskuna gave me a call on the phone and he said, my neighbor would like to talk to you. And I said, fine, have her give me a call. No, she said, you have to come visit her. She's stone deaf. She can't, she can't hear. And uh, so I, I, I went, and I didn't recognize her name. Her name was Azilda Calloway. She was 97 years old. So I went over to Niskuna and visited her. And I had to write her notes. I could, I could listen to her. She could respond. But I had to write her notes because she couldn't hear. Uh, she got, um, when she was, she was a music teacher. And when she was 40 years old, she got meningitis and then became deaf. And uh, her name was Azilda Calloway. And she told me she'd been married to John Wooden before she married this Mr. Calloway. And after John Wooden died, I think Wooden died about 1976, she married this Calloway. So she was a Zilda Calloway. And she, uh, she had this watch uh, that was given to John Wooden by the people of Fisher Ferry when he went away to school at Macon Randolph University in Richmond. He got a baseball scholarship. And uh, it's, of course, he was well known in Fisher Ferry. He was a lock tender at 19. He rented boats down on the river. He ran the ferry. And in, uh, in 19, uh, 1910, when he went away, they had a big party for him and gave him this gold watch. And she wanted to return it uh, to the town of Clifton Park. So it now rests down below in our history room here. And she had lots of baseball photos of John, and we got involved in telling lots of stories. So that was sort of an interesting, an interesting uh, happening. This is the um, aqueduct at Rexford. As many of you know, the Erie Canal came through Saratoga County for 13 miles. And uh, it came across on the Mohawk River. Um, a huge aqueduct at Crescent, it was the longest aqueduct um, in the Erie Canal system. Then it went back to the other side of the river at Rexford. Uh, that's why the Erie Canal was the eighth wonder. It was an engineering wonder. The canal crossed rivers. It went through locks. Um, it was amazing. Uh, but at any rate, this shows the Rexford Aqueduct. It was a drawing. And I discovered this at the Round Lake Antique Show in 1997. Anybody else here like to go to the Round Lake Antique Show? Yeah, I look forward to that every year, last weekend in June. Usually gets rained out, but uh, anyway, I saw this. I'm going along these booths, and I'm, I'm looking, and I, then I saw this, and I, I knew exactly what it was. And uh, it was signed by the artist, William Van Loan, and it was dated 1883. And he wanted $1,500 for it. And uh, so I walked away, looking at other booths, but looking back. And then I see other people looking at it. I said, oh, dear. So I uh, went up to the dealer and I said, well, uh, what's the best you can do on this? And he came down to 1200 And I said, well, uh, I didn't think the town would come up with $1,200 to buy this. So I said, uh, you know, I work at the New York State Museum. I think I can find a donor to acquire this for the museum. Uh, could I take it on approval? No. Uh, but I'll hold it for you with a $200 deposit. And uh, I, said, mm. I said, okay, well, stupid me. Went to an antique show without my checkbook. <clears throat> so I went all the way home to Fisher Ferry and got my checkbook, and I, I called another curator at the museum to make sure I wasn't stepping out of line here. And he said, go for it. So I, I gave him the $200 uh, deposit, which held it. And... Uh, I uh, later went back up to his antique shop. He was in Fort Anne, took photographs of it so I could send them to the donor, etc. And I did get a donor to buy it. It's now at the New York State Museum, so at least it's in public hands. 
And so this, this William Van Loan, uh, bird's eye views were a big thing at this time in the 1880s. You've probably seen bird's eye views of towns and villages or very map-like, except that they actually show the buildings. They would send an artist out and they would sketch the buildings and then someone would put a map together with these buildings on. And we think that that's what this was done for, that this was done to be lithographed as a bird's eye view, but they couldn't get enough subscribers to subscribe to it, so they never made the lithograph. Commerce and industry. Okay, so we were pretty well, much uh, a farming community. Uh, prior to 1961 when we became a suburb of Albany and Schenectady. And so there are a lot of farms here and the only thing that we really have remaining uh, today of these farms are, are barns and they're fast disappearing as well. Nobody wants to maintain uh, a barn uh, because they don't use them anymore. Uh, some of you may, may remember this uh, barn on, on Groom's Road that had the date in the roof, 1901. Yep. I uh, remember someone, I uh, had a column in the community news at the time, and somebody wrote to me and said, hey, you know, this, uh, this uh, 1901 barn is going to be celebrating its uh, 100th anniversary next year, and you should do an article on it. So I did an article on it, and I uh, did an article on barns that had the date and the roof and the, and the, uh, uh, the slate, yes. which was popular in the 1880s. They would put the date and the roof. So I did the article. Then later on, uh, somebody acquired the property. Somebody acquired. <coughs> Testing. Somebody acquired the property and wanted a subdivision there and they wanted to tear down the barn. Um, and and uh, <laughs> we went to a planning board meeting. We have a preservation commission and went to the planning board meeting and said, well, you know, before it's torn down, we should do a a seeker, you know, to, to uh, find out you know, the historical value of the building and maybe dig around it because it was a, uh, there might be some archaeological evidence there. Well, the builder, the, sub, the guy that owned the property didn't want to, you know, stall the project. He wanted the building down. He offered to uh, give it to someone who wanted the building. He said he'd pay $10,000 to have it dismantled and moved to somebody's property if we found somebody who wanted it. Well, we did. We found someone who wanted it, and they lived not very far from that area. And as soon as he found out we had somebody who wanted it, he tore the building down early in the morning without a demolition permit from the town. So it was done illegally. The people across the street had recorded it on a video camera, and it became a cause celebre here in Clifton Park, was on the news continuously. Um, an important person was associated with it because Mr. McCormick, the president of Trusco Bank, was the owner of the property. And uh, so some of you may remember all of the articles in the yeah. paper. Yeah. Uh, uh, finally, uh, the, everything was dropped. Um, again, it was just a sort of a power struggle. And uh, <laughs> we know how to get even. So uh, we found out that that property was on the map at the State Museum as an archaeological site, an Indian encampment. And so we had to call in, we had to do a seeker. So we had to do a, an archaeological survey, uh, which then, of course, delayed the project <laughs> even further. And uh, finally, he, he sold the land to another developer, he gave up and sold the land to another developer, and the other developer wanted to develop a uh, subdivision where you have a cluster, cluster housing and open space around it for horses. It was to be a horse, uh, you know, a development for people who have horses. And I, I thought, hey, this is ironic because the barn would have been perfect <laughs> or something like that, and now it's gone. And anyway, that's the story on that barn. And of course, we have another barn uh, that was painted blue. Uh, it's on Blue Barns Road. And why was it painted blue? Because the, that's the color that they would paint the box cars on the DNH Railroad that runs right by those barns. So he either stole those those cans of paint from the railroad, or he worked for the railroad, one of the others. And that's why the barns are blue. And that's why we have Blue Barns Road. Anybody remember this building? Yeah. Uh, this was the Jonesville Diner, 
and it's actually a 1939 diner. And these are prefab. They were meant to be taken apart, and they could be moved around. And it was originally owned by a man. His last name was Monet. And he had a series of these diners. Uh, this one was located uh, on Broadway, uh, 1243 Broadway, I believe. It was right near the, in Albany, right near the Manans line. And in uh, about 1964, a uh, man from Jonesville, uh, uh, his name escapes me right now, but he won this in a poker game. <laughs> he won the diner in a poker game, and it was moved to Jonesville, put on a foundation, and uh, a Riddle family acquired it in 1965, um, and they opened it and ran it as a diner until I think it was 1973, and then they sold it uh, to... Uh, uh, who operated it. And then uh, Stewart's came along and they, they, they wanted the site. This was in 1996. And so the Preservation Commission tried to find a place for the diner to go. We thought we had a place up on 146A and it didn't work out. Uh, finally, it was sold to a police officer from Roxbury, Massachusetts. And his plan was to set it up in, in Roxbury and, uh, and open it as a diner. Well, I followed up on this some years later to find out what happened to it, and he was not able to get the zoning variance to uh, set the diner up, so he donated it to the American Diner Museum, which was in Providence, Rhode Island. And they, they store these buildings and then uh, sell them to people who want a period diner, to, to actually operate a period diner. So um, I, followed up, uh, I followed up on that, um, maybe in 2000 it was, and found out that it was at the American Diner Museum. Then a couple of years later, I followed up to find out where, if it was still there, and uh, they had sold it to a, a business in Ohio. So the Jonesville Diner is now in Ohio, and I'm thinking someday maybe I'll do a bus trip so we can all go <laughs> eat at the Jonesville Diner in some place in Ohio. Community life. Oh, this is one of my, the more interesting uh, stories that I've got for you. Uh, this sampler right here, um, I found in the historian's records. When I became a historian, I inherited a lot of material, and there was an eight by 10 photograph of, of the sampler. And uh, I, don't know, I didn't at the time know where the original sampler was. I've since discovered its location. And uh, uh, what it is, is these were all girls in the same class. And so they wrote their names on the sampler. And then Cynthia Banker was the person who taught them this needlework. And it's dated Half Moon 1821. Now, uh, very important for uh, girls to learn needlework uh, because everything was, was handmade. They made their clothes. They had to stitch dates and numbers on blankets and sheets and things like that. So it was important that they, they know how to uh, embroider. So doing research, I found out that all of these, these girls who attended this class lived up in the northwest part of town, up by Boston Lake. And so I assumed that they went to this school, which was on Ashdown Road. It no longer stands. The school closed uh, in the early 1900s, and they, they started going to Burnt Hills. But uh, this, was a, this is where, uh, where Cynthia Banker taught. I also found out that these <clears throat> girls um, all became interrelated because they married each other's brothers. <laughs> and, and that was sort of interesting. Well, uh, I did, did an article on this because what was interesting to me was uh, Levina Lyon is my great-great-great-great-grandmother. And I had no idea that I had any connection to Clifton Park because they ended up in Edinburgh, up along the Sacandaga, uh, and they came from Connecticut. But I had no idea they, they evidently lived here in Clifton Park for a number of years before they, between Connecticut and, and Edinburgh. And uh, of course the name is spelled L-Y-O-N, but they're spelled phonetically L-I-O-N. So this was of great interest to me, and that's why I began to do all this research on it. 
um, after I had done a little article about it, um, I, uh, a woman called me. She lived in uh, the house that was near the site of where the schoolhouse was, and she had the original minute book from the school. So I, I stopped to, to visit her, and I said, oh, this is wonderful. Can I borrow it to go through it? She said, yes, you may. She says, but don't copy it. Well, you know, then it's fighting words. That's the first thing I did. <laughs> <laughs> Brought it to the library and I copied every damn page. Because you never know when you're gonna, if you're ever going to see it again. You know, she thought she had something valuable. And at any rate, so we have a copy of it. Uh, someday I'm hoping to get the original. Uh, sh uh, but at any rate, so going through the records, I find Cynthia Banker in there. She was hired at the school in 1821 to teach needlework. So that was kind of cool. There's two Brooks, too. Yes, that's right. Okay, how do I do that? There we go. Okay, so I did that article in 1996. Then in 1999, I'm, I'm sitting next to a fire in my living room. It's snowing like mad outside. <laughs> I'm drinking hot chocolate, maybe hot chocolate. <laughs> and, and then uh, the phone rings. And I pick up, and it's my friend Walt Fleming. And he's just come from the Schoharie Antique Show. And he said, hey, there's two samplers there at the Antique Show from Clifton Park. I said, you've got to be kidding. No. He said, and he gave me the price she wanted. I think it was 1200 for the two of them. At any rate, uh, <laughs> that Sunday, the next day, I went down to look at these samplers. And lo and behold, they were done at the same school at the same time. So this one was done. This one was done by Esther Schauber. Okay. Do you remember seeing the Schauber name on the other one? Yes. Yeah. There she is, Esther Schauber. And so, and, and it's got. I don't know if you can see it here. But it says C B School, Cynthia Banker. It's same date, 1821. How about that, Esther Schauber. And, uh, and the other sampler they had was by Anna Schauber, her, sis her sister. Anna Schauber is my name. English is my nation. <coughs> Clifton Park, my dwelling place. In Christ, my salvation. And these are verses that you find on a lot of, a lot of samplers. But this sampler is dated 1819. And it has a reference to Clifton Park, which is a very early reference to Clifton Park, because we didn't become a town until 1828. So uh, prior to 1828, we were the town of Half Moon. Everything says Half Moon. For a very short time, uh, 1816 to 1819, they referred to us as the town of Orange. But anyway, the area was still known as Clifton Park because of the Clifton Park land patent. They referred to the area as Clifton Park. So she actually, even though she's in the town of Half Moon, she actually says, Clifton Park is my nation. So anyway, uh, at this point, I went to the town board meeting and I got them, they agreed to buy these samplers. And uh, so these are now in the town history collection. In fact, they're right below here in the history room. And here's Esther Schauber herself and three of her sisters. Here's the Schauber house that still stands. We have a historic marker in front of it. And I've been in touch with descendants of Schauber and I've located that other sampler and I'm working on it. And that's where I got this picture, it was from a Schauber descendant. Anyway, you never know how things will end up. Uh, one of the big events here in town was the Labor Day clam bake held at the Jonesville Methodist Church. And they started in 1892, and it was an annual tradition here until 1965. They would get as many as 600 people to this clam bake. This panoramic view was taken in 1922. You can see the church in the background. In the background. And... Uh, this is only one panel of a panoramic view, so you're not seeing everybody. It, it uh, continues this way and it continues this way. You can see there's another table here, 
and this and the place where you got your food is over here. So what they would do, they would put these clam bakes together. They'd dig a big hole, align it with stones, and then throw the clam bakes in, cover them over with corn husks and dirt, uh, after they built a fire in there, of course. And, and then they would heat up for a couple hours, and then they would unbury them, and you'd have your clam bake. So needless to say, it was labor intensive. And by 1965, and people had other things to do, <laughs> so the clam bake went by the wayside. And people had some summer homes on the lake to go to, or things like that. So a lot of work. They couldn't get the people to do it. Um, the Grange Hall, which is now owned by the town, represents our agricultural heritage. And uh, um, for years, this was the focal point of all social activities. As I said, we were a farming community, so. We had dances here, uh, um, plays were put on here, uh, there was a junior grange, uh, and, and they had these wonderful oyster suppers. That was the annual event here at the grange, was the oyster su uh, suppers. Um, Edgar Schottmeyer, uh, they have had a big dairy farm. He would provide the milk. Uh, I don't know where they got the oysters from, but uh, he's some of the older people still talk about those days of the oyster suppers at the Grange Hall. Recreation. So anybody, did you realize that we had an amusement park here in town uh, over in Rexford? And this is the way it looked in the 1920s. It opened in 1906, and it was uh, started by the Schenectady Railroad to give people a destination so they could take the trolley from Schenectady uh, out to the amusement park. And this was, some, this was a national movement. Trolley lines all over the United States started building amusement parks. Coney Island was really popular at this time. People loved Coney Island. And so everybody was building their own little Coney Island. And it was the railroads that did this to give people a destination to get out of the city and go to an amusement park. And that's what happened here. And it came across the bridge, the largest uh, uh, steel bridge in the world, so they say, uh, and the piers from that bridge are still there in the Mohawk River, if you look to the west when you cross the uh, uh, Rexford 146 bridge, you can see these stone piers out in the river. The bridge was there until 1942, and 19, no, not 1945, they took it down for the war effort. They used the steel for the war effort. At any rate, there's the trolley right there at the Rexford Park stop. There's the carousel. There's the roller coaster. Uh, they had their own police force because they had thousands of people there in the summertime. And uh, <laughs> people, you know, people got into trouble. There was a, a group of guys called the Van Franken Gang, actually, that was constantly causing trouble there. Uh, uh, the carousel uh, was there early on, but then in 1913, they got a new carousel there, and the old carousel went to Forest Park, which was at the southern end of uh, Boston Lake. That, that opened about the same time. So they took the, the, the old carousel from Rexford Park. Rexford Park got a new one. That carousel at Forest Park, when Forest Park closed uh, in the late 1930s, the carousel was sold to a guy in Round Lake and the carousel was operated at Round Lake for a while. And in the 1940s, it went up to Cateros Park. And that's the carousel that's now in Congress Park. Uh, so this is uh, uh, Spud Barto and his wife Doris. And there's a panoramic view of the amusement park. Spud, as a kid, lived right near the amusement park. And when they opened the amusement park in the spring, they hired the kids to help clean the park. One of Spud's jobs was to clean the fun house. He had to wipe down all of the mirrors in the, in the fun house. And he said, you were fine as long as you didn't look into the mirrors. You had to keep your head down and look at the floor, otherwise you'd get lost. And then they had to test out the rides. So they were the first to ride the roller coaster and the merry-go-round for the season. And uh, this would have been in the 1920s. 
one of the things they had there was they had an outdoor stage where they had vaudeville performances uh, and circus performances. And one of the performers was uh, the amazing Oliver and his dog Uno. And uh, uh, the amazing Oliver would dive from a 100 foot tower into a tub of water. And his dog Uno would dive from a 50 foot high tower also into a tub of water. So they were featured. They also had a, an inside vaudeville theater. And one of the main attractions one year was a uh, demonstration of the new electric chair. <laughs> yes, a demonstration. Uh, and, and the newspaper reports indicate that it was really lifelike. <laughs> so uh, Spud donated this panoramic view of the amusement park uh, to the town, and we have that uh, down in the history room as well. Daily life, I'll talk a little bit about daily life. Everybody went to a one-room schoolhouse here in Clifton Park until 1953. That was the first year that the Shenandoah campus opened. So a lot of people here, older people, who remember going to one-room schoolhouses where you have all your classes together. Um, you know, one class would come up to the front and recite their lessons and then go back and the next class would come up. So you could learn from the class ahead of you. Anyway, Elmer Drums um, uh, reached 100 years old, as you can see, and he was 100 years old when I interviewed him. And I interviewed him, and I interviewed Myra Peck, who was a couple years older than, uh, than Elmer. She must have been 101 or 102 when I interviewed her. And they both told me the same story, so it must have made quite an impression on both of them. They went to, this is the one-room schoolhouse that was at Groom's Corners right here. And both of them went to that school. They were actually classmates. And both of them told me the story of being in school one day and hearing all of this commotion come down Sugar Hill Road, clang, clang, bang, bang, bumpity bump. And they all stood up on their desks to look out the window to see what it was. And it was Dr. Strang of Vischer Ferry coming down the road in his horseless carriage. <laughs> Can you imagine for the first time seeing something running under its own power, something not being pulled by a horse, and what that you know, must have been to these kids? And that is Dr. Strang with his automobile park next to the uh, uh, groom's store. Clifton Park in the nation. So we had association with several American presidents here in Clifton Park. Uh, the first was George Washington, who in uh, 1783 was coming north to visit General Gordon up in Boston Spa. And he crossed the river at Ford's Ferry. And when Nathaniel Sylvester wrote his history of Saratoga County in 1878, um, there was a woman who remembered a story that her grandmother told her about George Washington crossing on the ferry and how regal he looked standing next to his horse. And when he, his, uh, her grandmother had offered him a glass of water from the well there at Fort's Ferry when he, he got to that side. So um, that was an interesting connection. He passed through Fisher Ferry, and through Clifton Park um, on his way up to Boston Spa. Chester A. Arthur taught school here in Clifton Park. And he taught at uh, school number eight, the one on Ashdown Road. As I mentioned, those same uh, records of the school that I copied. Um, uh, he's listed in here. They paid him uh, to be a teacher, and he taught there in 1846, so it's right in the record book. He also taught in Rexford. He was going to school in U Union College, so uh, that was right nearby. So he was employed as a teacher here in Clifton Park. Uh, this being Black History Month, uh, people don't associate with slavery with the North, but yes, we had slavery here in the North. New York was one of the largest slave-holding states in the nation, and uh, Clifton Park had slaves here also. Uh, in fact, the Van Vranken family were the largest slaveholders in Saratoga County. Uh, this is a, uh, uh, a sale that we have here in the Town History Collection. Uh, it's also up online. Uh, so some of those photographs I mentioned that you can access from the library website. 
is the sale of a Negro woman and child by Derchi Van Dranken to Christopher Miller of Fisher Ferry, dated 1786. It says, I, Derchi Van Dranken, sell unto the said Christopher Miller one Negro wench, about 26 years of age, named Nan, together with a male child, about 11 months old, named Yap. So this is a, a lot of kids in the uh, fourth grade have to use original documents uh, to learn how to use original documents. And this is uh, one of the documents that I uh, give the teachers to, uh, to use. Also, uh, Edgar Schottmeyer, who's one of our older citizens, you may remember, he, he, him, he and his uh, wife Mary used to attend a lot of the town board meetings. Anyway, he lived in this, this house here on Bishop Ferry Road probably familiar with it. And he would tell me, he said, uh, he heard oral tradition that um, the Cattell farmhouse was a stop on the Underground Railroad. And I would argue with him. I would say, uh, Edgar, that's impossible because that farmhouse wasn't built until after the Civil War, probably built about 1880. This is when it was burned down to make room for the development, now called the Oaks. And uh, so, but then I was doing some research, and I found out that there was an earlier house near the site of, of uh, the Cattell farmhouse. And there was a free black family who lived in that house. And there was another free black family that lived on Ray Road. And both of them received land up in the Adirondacks from Garrett Smith, uh, who worked, who, uh, um, worked to uh, give blacks the right to vote after the Civil War. You couldn't vote unless you owned land. So he had this big tract of land in the Adirondacks, and he would uh, give blacks uh, a free plot of land so they could so they could vote. At any rate, so they had some connection with the abolitionist movement because here Garrett Smith was very involved with that. And so I suspect that indeed um, uh, Thompson. Uh, did operate on the Underground Railroad. And that, uh, we also found out that uh, the man who operated the ferry in Fisher Ferry, uh, George, I uh, mm, can't think of the last name, but he was a black man. So it's very possible that they came right across at Fisher Ferry, right up Fisher Ferry Road. They could have stopped either at Ray Road or at this place on Fisher Ferry Road and on up. There's also a site on the Underground Railroad uh, on the corner of Route 146 a and Ashdown Road, and also in, in Rexford, near where the uh, uh, Edison Club is. There was a stop on the Underground Railroad. So we were very much involved with the abolitionist movement here in Clifton, Clifton Park. And we need to do more research on that. Ghosts in cemeteries. So this is the uh, Groom's Methodist Church, which is the church that's uh, next to the entrance to the uh, dump. And uh, when we moved here in 1971, what, what, this is one of five churches that combined to form Shenandoah Methodist on Route 146. So the building had been sold, and it was a furniture store. It was called the Deacon's Bench. <laughs> Did anybody remember the Deacon's Bench? Yes, yes. And it burned in 1975. It was one of the biggest fires that we've had here in Clifton Park. Now all that's left is the cemetery. But uh, can you see the, there's an obelisk here in the cemetery. And that's very interesting because there's, there's no bodies there. This is a monument to Seymour and Catherine Maria Birch. And they died on the steamboat Atlantic um, on Lake Erie in 1852. They were traveling to visit relatives in Detroit um, and they and several other members of their family took passage on the Atlantic, which was a side wheeler, and it had set records for speed. And it was going pretty fast, headed west. But coming from the other direction was the Ogdensburg, an even newer ship, uh, and it was trying to set a record as well, and they had a head-on collision on Lake Erie. Well, they kept going their different ways, thinking there was no damage done, but the Atlantic started to sink, and uh, the uh, Ogdensburg turned around to come back to rescue passengers. Uh, this was all written up in the Albany Argus. 
Um, Mrs. Birch could not figure out how to use her life preserver, which was actually a cushion from one of the seats. And when they jumped overboard, uh, she lost it, and she went to climb on her husband's, and they both went down. And this is all the reports of their bodies are in the bottom of Lake Erie, but they erected this nice monument. Oops. Yeah. Okay, so this, um, this is the Abraham Best House. Uh, I know this house quite well. And uh, that's Mitch Hayden. She was the previous owner of the house. And uh, she told us a story <laughs> of uh, being visited by a psychic one day. The bell, bell rang, she went to the door, and the psychic said, she says, I haven't been able to sleep nights. There's something, something's going on here on this property. She said, is there a cemetery? Is somebody buried here? Well, yes, the builder of the house is buried in a vault uh, on the, in the ravine on the north side of the property. So <laughs> Midge went over to the vault with her, and the kids had broken into the vault and taken the lid off the coffin. And the old man best, you know, he had red hair. You could see the red hair was still there. And um, so Midge fixed it up. She said she wasn't going to have anybody else break into it. She had a bulldozer come in, and she plowed that, that vault under uh, a lot of dirt so that nobody would ever <laughs> find it again. Now it's all eroded away, and you can peek through through the top. Uh, but. Uh, uh, she, uh, she was a little annoyed. There's the vault, the way it looked before she plowed it under. Not many people know it's there. From farms to suburbs, none of then of course the character of our town changed completely with the opening of the North Way north to Clifton Park in 1959. And uh, uh, Robert Van Patent, he uh, Climbed on to a great idea. He bought a, a lot of land, 40 farms uh, around the North Way. Um, and uh, the last parcel he bought up was the parcel from Vincent Segata, who lived in the old Barney <coughs> farmhouse. This is the Barney farmhouse <coughs> right here, uh, which was on what's now known as Barney Road. That was the last section of the Knolls to be developed. And uh, what Van Patten would do what he would be to off, offer to build the farmer and his wife a new house in his development uh, in return you know, for selling their land to him. And uh, the, the northern part of, of this, of the Clifton Knolls, was the farm of Heath Peck and his wife. Uh, that farmhouse still stands on Clifton Park Center Road. There's a historic marker in front of it, uh, Beach, Beach, Beachwood. It's the first area of the Knolls to be developed uh, around the Locust Lane Clubhouse. And that was part of the Heath Peck farm. And so he built them a house in the development. And when Mrs. Peck moved in, she was delighted because for the first time in her life, she had running water that came right into her kitchen sink. She didn't have to go outside to pump it. You didn't have to go out back to go to the bathroom either. She had an indoor bathroom. This is in 1961 in Clifton Park. So she was delighted. But Van Patten couldn't get Vincent Sagata to sell. Sagata had created these ponds, and he stocked them with fish, and he advertised in Albany for people to come out to the country in Clifton Park and fish in his ponds. He would charge them a fee to fish in the ponds. And he didn't need a house. He was a bachelor. In fact, in the wintertime, he only lived in one room of the house. He had hay stuffed in the rest of the house, bales of hay. Anyway, so then Van Patten offered him a, uh, an apartment in the clubhouse that he built. And he went for that. So he finally sold the land. And Van Patten let him name some of the streets. And he was a native Spaniard. So Par del Rio, El Dorado, Casablanca. Those are all street names that uh, he, he gave to the subdivision. And so uh, you know, Clifton Park is very different today. We went from a population of about 4,000 people in 1960 to about 38,000 today. And that's about all I have to tell you today. Any questions? <laughs>